It's four o'clock, and uh, we're supposed to be at the beach at 5.30. So, 5.15. 5.15, sorry. So no questions. <laughs> the, the only question you can ask her at the beach, OK? So um, plus, I'm going to maybe cut short my, my talk. So and I had to add a bunch of slides uh, because of uh, some incidents. So I'm going to talk today about methylation. Uh, this is going to be a talk about a few papers, but because it's going to be cut short and maybe some... It's not on? Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Now, So I'm going to talk about methylation today, and this is the talk is an overview of a few papers uh, that we've done in the last two, three years. And um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to get into the details of all of them because uh, we want to go to the beach. So uh, let me start. So basically, methylation from, uh, from our perspective for this talk, uh, these are changes in the DNA that happen uh, during our lifetime. <coughs> and uh, each cell, each of our cells has a different, in each position, each of our cells can be either methylated or not methylated. And what we can measure is in each position of the genome, we can measure whether the, uh, what's the fraction of the cells that are methylated. So we get a matrix that looks like this, and uh, every row here corresponds to an individual. Every column corresponds to a methylation site. Uh, typically, actually it says 450, but uh, today the new technologies give you something like 850, uh, 850,000. <coughs> uh, so it's a, it's a big matrix. And um, what you get is, you see, these are numbers between 0 and 1. That's if you have a 0.7, that basically means that in that position, that individual has 70% of the cells that are methylated in that position. So uh, why is methylation important? Uh, so first of all, it's been shown that it's correlated to disease. And this is actually our main motivation of working on this. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot of diseases today that have been shown to be related. There's relations between methylation and uh, and this is, and this is actually one thing that I forgot to mention. This is called epigenome-wide association studies, just like genome-wide association studies, just that instead of genetics, now we, we look at epigenetics, which is methylation in this case. Uh, it captures pretty nicely some demographics and other features. So for instance, age, if you, what, what you see here on the side is a figure that shows the correlation between age, uh, so just the age of the person and the methylation age, which is essentially just a few methylation sites that predict really well the, uh, the age. So I can take your DNA uh, and tell you what's your age up to about one year of, uh, of error. And this is actually coming from uh, Steve Horvath, who's here in UCLA. Um, <clears throat> the, it also is related to other things like genetics. So there's a lot of methylation sites that are um, influence or affected by genetics. If sometimes it's completely heritable and sometimes less. Uh, RNA expression, there is a generally a negative uh, correlation between RNA and methylation. It's pretty weak, the, the, the negative correlation, but there is, it captures some to some extent. Uh, there is a role in, in cancer, and most importantly, uh, it's pretty easy to get today. So it's relatively cheap. You can get for about $200, let's say 250 you can get this array of uh, 850,000. Uh, and unlike genetics, uh, potentially it's actionable in the sense that you can uh, maybe change it. So let me talk about what is actionable. OK, so <laughs> I heard there was a discussion about this this morning. So an actionable hobby based on the CGSI definition is a hobby that you do. <laughs> is a hobby that you do two people together. So for instance, ping pong is a great uh, example. This one, pool is a great example. Eating is a great example. <laughs> what is not actionable? So reading a book, unless, you know, you can always read in a group, I, I understand, okay, but reading a book is not actionable. Taking pictures <laughs> is not actionable. <laughs> okay, so let's go back because we don't have time. Um, so, uh, so typically in a standard EOS analysis, what we do is uh, some type of linear regression uh, where we have in the notations here, we have uh, Y is the phenotype, X are some fixed effects. So um, uh, like uh, um, Saron talked about yesterday about the linear mixed models. So we have 
random effects and fixed effects. So in this case, fixed effects, we don't have random effects, so these are all uh, fixed effects, age, gender, um, so it could be intercept, it could be different things that you think could potentially affect your uh, phenotype. Um, and then MJ is the methylation, it's a vector of this big matrix that I showed you, it's the jth uh, vector in this uh, um, matrix. And epsilon is just noise. So this is standard linear regression. Uh, the problem when you try to do this analysis, just like when you do it in a GWAS, is that you have uh, confounders. So confounders are basically things that affect uh, the, the phenotype, and they also affect uh, what you measure or what you kind of test. So in, this, in our case, methylation. Uh, so kind of this is a, a classical example, right? But there's many uh, confounders affect a lot of our studies uh, in, many, in many cases, and this is something that we have to, to think about. And in GWAS, people have thought about it for, for a while, and they kind of solve it to, uh, I, I would say, in, in most cases. Uh, and and the, the thing that affects us the most over there is population. It's because population affects the disease, population affects uh, the SNP, and because th therefore there is some correlation between disease and population, disease and the, uh, the population and the SNP, and then we'll have a correlation between the SNP and the disease, but it's not a real, uh, I mean, it's a real correlation, but it's not, a, there's no, there's nothing that we learned about the biology over there, because all we learned essentially is that that SNP is related to the population. In methylation, it's a little bit, I mean, uh, population also affects us, but there's other confounders that can affect us. And one of the major ones, or I would say the major one, is cell type composition. So let me explain what it is. Uh, let's say that we have cases and controls, like you see here, and let's say that there's a met specific methylation site. When you see a dot, uh, that basically means that there is a, a methylation. How does this work? Yeah, so here, for instance, this guy is methylated, but this guy here is not methylated. So some of the cells are methylated in that position, some of them are not. You take a typical control, you have about 40% that are methylated. You take a typical case, you have about 60% that are methylated. Now, um, that sounds great because that basically means that that methylation site is correlated with the, the fact that some people are cases and some people are controls, and so maybe this site is somehow affecting the disease or affected by the disease, so the causality could be in both ways, but it's somehow related to the disease. Uh, and it is related to the disease because there is correlation, but it's a statistical correlation and there's no, uh, not necessarily causality. And in this case, it could be that there's two types of cells in this tissue, red cells and blue cells. And let's say that the red cells are never methylated in that position, and the blue cells are always methylated in that position. So this is, of course, not necessarily, you, you can have cases that are less extreme, uh, but what you see is that in this case, uh, you'll get the 60% and 40% if typically the cases have more blue than red cells. Okay, so what you actually found is not that that gene specifically is, is interesting for the disease, but that that cell type is uh, more common in the people that have the disease. So it's not that it's less important, it's just a different, you kind of answer a different question. So um, just like we had with with the population and GWAS, here we have the confounder is just the, uh, the cell type composition. Uh, and uh, one way to now to, to uh, somehow resolve this confounder is to just measure the cell counts. And, um, uh, and well, actually, I'm going to get to it in a second. So the cell type composition is correlated with MJ in this case, and it's correlated with Y, and therefore we have a correlation between Y and MJ. If we don't correct, for, uh, for, the, for the fact that we have set up composition, that's kind of what we get. This is a QQ plot, which is basically shows you what is the, um, what is the, log, what is the p value that is expected. This is minus log of the, or minus log of the p value and minus log of the observed p value. And if there is no confounders, you should expect to see them on the y equals x. Uh, typically, again, it could be that the entire genome is somehow related to, to this disease, this is for rheumatoid arthritis. But if it's not the entire uh, genome that is related, you should see everything, uh, you should see most of the points fall on, the, on this line. But here it's way off the line, if you don't correct. So one way to correct is to add the cell counts as fixed effects. 
So add them to the matrix X. So let's say that you basically go and you do CBC, so blood count, if you took a, a blood tissue. And you just add, uh, you just add the numbers that you get from the, from the blood count and you say, okay, I have this much of this cell type, uh, red cell type and this much of the blue cell type. And I'm just gonna add these two numbers to my uh, regression. So that's all great, but in most cases, we don't have the cell counts. And there's different reasons that we can talk when we're in the beach, why? But basically there's different logistical reasons. Sometimes uh, it's not so easy to find, it's sometimes, just how to, uh, to extract those. But generally when you go, if you go to GEO, you go to dbGaP and you look at uh, the data sets or you go to your colleagues that have data, they typically don't have the cell counts. They only have the methylation. Uh, so we need to estimate the cell counts. Now, before I go into the estimation, I, would say, I, I want to emphasize one thing. It's really not critical to emphasize exactly the um, the, the cell counts, but some linear transformation of them, because we're talking about linear regression, and linear regression works the same if you transform, if you if you apply a linear transformation to them. Okay, so it doesn't really matter, and uh, most uh, most applications or most methods basically don't really try to to find the cell counts themselves, but they find try to find some kind of a linear transformation of the cell counts. And uh, I would say that uh, probably all the methods, but I would be careful that, and say that most of the methods are doing uh, matrix factorization, which I, I'm gonna call the composition uh, of the data, which is essentially taking your matrix X and uh, writing it as approximately two matrices, W and Z, the product of two matrices, W transpose and Z. Uh, and this is kind of a, a low rank representation of the matrix X, if you think about it. And there's different ways of doing this. And we heard about PCA, that's one of them, but there's other ways of doing this. Uh, and, uh, and what we have is that basically what the, the point X or the methylation at site J for individual I is going to be the product of two, uh, of two, of one row and one column that basically that for each cell type, there's K cell types, for each cell types, I'm going to have a number, which is what's the proportion of that cell type in the population, in the cell population of that individual. And then uh, what's, the, what's the typical methylation level of that, in that cell type, in that position, okay? And then I just sum them up, okay? So it just, I just sum up K numbers this way. Okay, so this, in this case, that would be, uh, W transpose would be for every individual we have the cell counts the K cell counts of, uh, of that uh, individual, and this matrix Z will be for each cell type and for each position in the genome, 850,000 positions, what's the uh, typical cell, uh, what, what's the typical methylation in that position? And so, again, like I said, there's many different methods. I just list a bunch of them, and uh, incidentally, two of them are ours, but there's, there's others. There's maybe uh, probably dozens of different methods different types of, of variants of, of PCA, non-negative matrix factorization, and, and you know, some of them are supervised, some of them are unsupervised, and so on. The supervised approach just kind of, uh, I'm gonna talk about the unsupervised approach, but just generally, uh, for this supervised approach, you can imagine that the matrix Z is given to you. Someone went and did a, a more expensive experiment where they sorted the cells and they measured methylation for er every cell type. And now you have a matrix Z that represents this, uh, kind of what's the typical methylation level in every uh, position in every cell type, okay? In the unsupervised, I don't have those. I have to find both W and Z. And, and again, this is a, a kind of a, represent a representation of all these methods. So one of them, like I said, PCA is one of the, uh, probably most common way of doing this, or the kind of the, the first method that people will try. And uh, Lior gave a great introduction yesterday uh, to PCA, and I'm going to kind of uh, capitalize on, on, on that, basically just explain a little bit about the, the probabilistic view of PCA. It's a little bit, slightly different than what uh, Lior uh, described yesterday, but, but it's the same idea. So one, 
assumption, actually that's exactly what, what Lior mentioned yesterday, is that you have a matrix uh, that is low rank plus a matrix which is noise. So this is going to be your low rank matrix plus noise. You remember you had the, this hyperplane and then you, add, you added a normal noise in all directions. That was, uh, that's, that's this noise here and this is the low rank and this is your matrix. So your matrix is the sum of these two. And uh, in PCA, you basically want to try to, uh, to essentially you want to try to find this low rank matrix. That's, that's really what you're trying to do. So um, what we observed, it, so you know, we tried many different methods like uh, what you always uh, try. So we tried to kind of uh, make this, this uh, QQ plot goes to the Y equals X. That, that was our goal in, let's say in the rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and uh, what we observed is that really most sites do not really, there's no difference between different cell types. Okay, so uh, there's really a kind of a, a concentration of the X matrix, this, uh, uh, sorry, the, the uh, signal matrix uh, in, in just a small number of methylation sites. So the real picture that we thought uh, happens is, is this one. You have a signal matrix, which is sparse, column sparse, which means that most of the uh, most, most of the columns here are zero, and some of them are just low rank, plus noise. Noise you have across the entire in all the methylation sites, and that's the matrix that you get. And you want to use this information. If that's true, then you want to use this information. So uh, the method that we came up with is a very simple method, which uh, you know you can see it as a disadvantage because it's very simple. But I actually uh, think that it's an advantage because you can understand what's going on. It's just three lines. Plus, you can implement it in just three lines in in uh, whatever you like R, uh, MATLAB, Python. Okay, so you compute a matrix M tilde, which is the low rank approximation for the methylation matrix, and how do you do this? I said no question, so SVD. This is typically what you do, uh, and, and this will give you the low rank approximation for the methylation matrix M. Then you take, for every methylation site, you look at, uh, at the jth column of the original matrix, MJ, and the jth, jth column of M tilde, so we call this M tilde J, and we look at the correlation between them. And actually, in our original paper, we looked at the distance between them, but it, you know, correlation, it's easier to, to meet, for me at least, to understand it. Um, and then, uh, so you look at those, and you take the T sites that have the, to the, the highest correlations. Okay, so, and then we perform PCA on these T sites. Okay, so really three lines. All you need to do is, PCA or SVD, it's the same in terms of the computation for M. You get a low rank approximation for M. And then you need to do correlation in every site. This is, you know, again, correlation is just one command. And then you do, you do again PCA. So everyone that knows how to write the code that has correlation and PCA can write this in five minutes. Okay? So it's, it's very simple. And uh, as I'll show you, it works better. So this is, I'm, I'm, you know, again, I'm using... Uh, this, these slides I just added today, but basically the, the idea here is to kind of use what Lior sh showed yesterday and give you an intuition based on that. So let's say that I have, uh, that my data is, is just two-dimensional, but really just one, in, in my signal matrix I only have one dimension, and the other, uh, but I have noise in both, both dimensions. So this, it will look like this. It's kind of like the x-axis plus a little bit of, of noise, right? And so that's what we have here. And then we run PCA, and if we run PCA, we'll get a line that goes uh, like this, and like uh, Leo explained yesterday, uh, there is going, to, the, the, we, we take the line that gives us the best uh, square distances. The minimum square distances, uh, when we take an orthogonal line from that point to, just the projection of that point to the line, okay? So if we know that in this case, let's say just one, one of the dimension is just is the signal and the other one is there is no signal, then we know based on that that probably the real signal is this. The, the real uh, PCA should be this or the real um, yeah, signal matrix is this one. And the rest is noise. 
Okay, so so the projection on this line, and so that's the idea. It's it's a bit, it's not perfect this example because the number of dimension here is two, and the number of of methylation sites here is one, and and the number of signal matrices uh, signal uh, um, the dimension of the signal is one. So we have twice one, but I couldn't really plot it in more dimensions. But if anyone has an idea how to do this, then I'll be happy to change my slides for the next time. Uh, so, so that's basically the idea. <clears throat> now just one comment, uh, and it's maybe less critical for most of you, but if you run an EWAS, and there's, if you think about it, there's a feature selection, which is the first two lines, and then there's, you run the PCA on the features that were selected, right? So the first two lines of the algorithm are just feature selection. Yes? That's a great question. So the question was, why don't I basically just take the ones with higher variation and, uh, and, and take out the ones that are not? Yeah. Uh, so there's actually an, an algorithm by uh, uh, Ian Johnston for sparse PCA, Johnston and Lou, from about 10 years ago, uh, that uh, they did something, sim they, you know, they proposed something similar. Uh, in, practice, in practice, it doesn't work, and it's not very practical because the variance, you, you usually uh, standardize your, your matrix, so every column is going to have the same variance in any case. Um, but even if, you, if, even if you don't, you know, even if you start from the, the actual, uh, you know, under theoretical settings, we can show, and I actually removed these slides, but we can show that then we get better results than the Johnston, Johnston law because um, that's a question for the beach. It's like it's going to take a little bit longer to explain, but, but theoretically, you can show mathematically that this will be not as, not as good as just doing what we did. Okay? Yeah, just the intuition is that there is, think about the two dimensional thing plus noise, right? So if you take the variance, you essentially take all the dimensions, including the dimensions that are less important, that are just noise. Okay, if you take the top two dimensions, then if you did a reasonable job in the first PCA, then you should capture these two dimensions, and then you'll do, then most of, of what you have is the, not the noise. If you take the variance, you take everything. That's kind of the intuition, but yeah. So the feature selection, when you do, when you run EWAS, it's probably a good idea to do the feature selection uh, on on the cases only so that you avoid false negatives. But, you know, I don't want to get into the, into this point because I think it's kind of a, a side point, but, and we have the bit soon. So, um, so we get better results. I'm going to skip on some of the results that we have, but generally we compare to many, many different methods, including some methods that people use in genomics like peer, factor analysis, uh, PCA, it's written here in the, you know, it's one of the lines here. Uh, and uh, to sparse PCA from, the, again, that Lior mentioned yesterday by uh, Daniela Witten. Uh, so we are also compared to them. And all of these methods, so these are in different graphs. I don't have all of them in the presentation, but they're all in the paper. Uh, and, and you can see that in some, so each of these figures here is one cell type. So this is lymphocytes and monocytes and so on. And this, the x-axis is the number of components that we're using, because remember, this is PCA or, or methods like PCA that you have to def decide what is the number of dimensions that you have. So in order to compare apples to apples, we basically say, uh, let's fix for a second the number of, of dimensions. Let's say that it's three, and let's see which method gives us the best results. And in some, some cell types, we do all the methods do about the same, but in a bunch of the cell types, uh, you know, I guess here in the granular sites, and as, uh, I think you could argue that also in the monocytes, we have uh, significantly better results. Uh, we also did some simulations um, that basically uh, don't use any, so, so in this data here, actually we had cell counts in this way. This is how we, we were able to, to detect. But one of the problems in the field is that you don't have a lot of data sets that have cell counts. That's what, that's what I told you in the beginning. So how do you actually test whether what you have is, is uh, um, uh, useful? So one way we did it is we took uh, uh, the methylation matrix and we had, let's say that we had cell types either 
uh, the cell counts, uh, either that uh, we got it, as basically someone measured it, or we estimate it using a supervised method. And so let's say this is, these are the numbers. Then we split the data into two just based on the cell counts, okay? Not based on the methylation, just based on the cell counts. Uh, and this is our phenotype. One type of cell count and the other type of cell count. So this is kind of a clustering that we did. We did some k-means and we got two means in this case and then we got uh, uh, two different sets just based on the cell counts. And so you, now when you do the regression, you're not supposed to get anything because if you correct for the cell counts because the cell, you're correcting for the cell counts. So not everything that you find is essentially false positive. Uh, and, and this is what you see. You see that uh, we also have some false positives. Uh, but even if you compare a uh, compare method to a reference-based method, which is the one that, that, most, that many people use for blood specifically, then we get better results in terms of, so most of the bolds are here. Uh, what you see in parentheses is uh, the numbers when you correct for FDR. And this is actually another kind of take-home message, is that if you don't correct for the confounders well enough, then you have a lot of false positives with the FDR. So you have to make sure that you, that you have a good correction for the confounders before you run FDR. Uh, so, so yeah, so we get better results in this sense. Uh, the other thing, so, you know, again, you try to, to show that your method works uh, better in some sense. The other way you can try to show this is uh, use, just show mathematically that you get uh, better results than something else. The problem is most of the methods that people are using, SVA, PEER, and so on, don't have any, as far as I know, don't have any, any uh, mathematical proof that shows that they do anything, you know, asymptotically they behave well. Uh, there are some exceptions, so especially the methods that are, that are easier to, to analyze because they're simpler. Like the johnson lu method that I mentioned before, uh, PCA has a lot of uh, papers that are basically discussing the asymptotics. So we gave it a try, uh, and um, it's, our proof is not optimal, but right now uh, it says something like that. So I'm gonna, we have a proof for many dimensions, but I'm just going to present it for one dimension. So we have Z is a random matrix, and X is a rank one matrix, which is a scalar alpha times rho times nu transpose. These are two vectors. Uh, and um, and we, ass we assume that most of the columns in the matrix X are zero. So this, you can do this by just placing rho j equals zero for, uh, for large uh, j's, j greater than t. And nu in this case is uh, a random vector that's not really critical, but... Um, and then y is the sum of X plus z, and it's standardized. So uh, again, in the picture it looks like this. We have y, which is the data, which is x plus z divided by square root of n, and x is just a one-dimensional or one-rank matrix, which is alpha rho nu transpose. For those of you who know the spiked uh, model, so this is basically a spiked model with one, um, uh, with uh, just rank one. So rho j is zero for j greater than t, so this is actually how x looks, how the matrix looks. So uh, one of the good reasons to use PCA is because, or SVD in this case, is because this is, uh, there's a theoretical foundation to, that, said, that explains why PCA works. And the theoretical foundation is based on this theorem that says that if you want to approximate Y with the lowest rank, then uh, you should use SVD. That's the best you can do in many different metrics, okay? And specifically in the matrix that we looked at, which is the Frobenius matrix, but uh, it's true also for many other matrix, uh, uh, metrics. But uh, in fact, what we're interested in is not approximating Y. We're interested in approximating X. Okay? Now, um, approximating X, if I had all the information in the world as a low rank matrix. So the, the uh, Eckel Young theorem is a mathematical theorem that basically says the SVD is going to give you, is, is there, you cannot have a lowest rank approximation which is close to Y. You know, even if you had infinite amount of time and infinite amount of information, you had all the information in the world, you couldn't do this. And when it, it comes to X, uh, then the lowest rank approximation to x is just x itself because x is low rank, 
right? Now, so, so this is really what's interesting, and there's, a, there's been a bunch of papers that discuss this over the last uh, at least 10 years that try to think about it uh, this way. So how do, how do I find x? Or oh, x is really my goal and not, not really y. Uh, so, so we, you know, we had a few assumptions. Again, because of uh, lack of time, I'm not going to go into those. But essentially, we make an assumption. That assumption number three here is that we have sparsity, that it's really sparse. Uh, and assumption number two here is that the signal is large enough. You remember this alpha times uh, rho times nu transpose. So the signal is, is large enough. And then we also have an assumption on the on the dimensions of the of the matrix. And and you need it because. Uh, uh, you need to say, uh, this is asymptotic, all of this is asymptotic, uh, actually not, it's with high probability, so it's not really asymptotic, but basically if M and, uh, grows much larger than N, or vice versa, then things, uh, things change. Uh, and, and again, M over N is better, which is greater than one, this is just uh, kind of a technicality in the, in, the, in the proof, you could probably do it also when N, M over N is smaller than one, but then the numbers are going to change. Then what we can show is that if we do this, then you take the, SV, the uh, SVD, which is XSVD, and you compare X, S, the X that you get from SVD to X, and you look at it at the Frobenius norm. Frobenius norm is basically just the sum of squares of the differences. And uh, what we can show is that with high probability, uh, if we compare X to the X that we get from refactor, we get uh, better results than going from the SVD. Okay, so that, that basically means if it's sparse, then you should go and, do, and, and use refactor. This is uh, tricky because you don't really know ahead of time if it's sparse, right? So, but that's what we can, you know, that's what we can prove and there's, a, there's kind of a gap between pr the proof and, 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 and in what happens in practice because when we try to generate data, uh, and just simulate, then we show that this is actually true also when it's not sparse. It just, when it becomes, when T gets very, very, very large, then it's about the same as PCA. Okay, so you don't really lose much by using this. Maybe when, it, when T is, is full, you know, when basically when the, the signal is all over the place, then maybe PCA is slightly better. You know, it's hard to say. But, uh, but typically, the, the signal is going to be somewhat sparse, I think. Okay, so uh, th there's two more things that I wanted to talk about, but I'm going to skip one of them, which is basically, um, you know, uh, I'm just going to say that we wanted to try to say what happens if we have some, ex some additional information, and this additional information was that, let's say that we know what is the typical cell type, cell count distribution in uh, in the population, so we went to the medical records here in uh, UCLA, and we know we learned this, the cell count, uh, cell count distribution from the population, and we plug it in, and we get uh, a much better results this way in terms of actually finding the the cell counts, uh, cell counts themselves. Now, uh, in the last ten minutes, I want to I want to explain uh, a new project which is uh, still. I would say work in progress, although it's almost complete. Uh, and then uh, in, in this case, what we want to think about is cell type specific effect. So in cell type specific effect, imagine that you have three cell types, cell type one, two, three. And um, one of them, in this case, cell type three is different between the cases and the controls, but the other two are not. Okay, uh, but when you look at what, what you see, you don't see what's the methylation level in cell type 1, in cell type 2, and cell type 3. Uh, you see the combination of those. So you have the cell type composition of each individual, and you, uh, what you observe is, let's say in control number 1, you see uh, the, this fraction times cell type 1, plus this fraction times cell type 2, and so on. Uh, and so you get these numbers, and these numbers are masked basically by the cell type 1 and cell type 2 that don't have a difference between cases and controls. And what you get is that there is the, the average doesn't seem to be different between cases and controls. Okay, so if you try to do now an analysis, then you, you wouldn't see any difference between them. Um, okay. 
So that's actually true also if you try to, to adjust the cell counts, basically for, you know, adjust for the cell counts, then you'll get the same, same issue as, as we'll show before. So as we'll, we'll show later. But uh, one, what we really want to do is take the observed and go back and find what is the methylation level in cell type 3. Let's say, again, if we had an infinite amount of information, infinite amount of time, that's what really what, you know, what we really want to do. And then we can run an EWAS on cell type 3. Okay, so, um, so basically, uh, that, that's kind of what we want to uh, try to do. And we call, the, we call this tensor composition analysis. And it's, uh, it's really, like I said, it's, it's work in progress. So um, don't scoop us. Um, <laughs> so what we do is, I'm, go I'm just going to give an overview of, what we, of how we think about it. And this is actually just a partial way of how we think about it, because I would need the entire hour uh, to explain exactly what we do over there. But just generally, we have n samples, m sites, and uh, k cell types, like we had before. And uh, we have a distribution of uh, the K cell types over the M uh, methylation sites. This distribution basically now, we, uh, really for every individual, for every cell type and every methylation site, we have a number, right? Which is generated by this distribution. Okay. Um, and on top of this, what we have is cell composition that we can put, you know, potentially infer in some cases or sometimes we can just get it. And then, like, like I said before, what we, have, what we really have is just this weighted sum based on the cell counts uh, of you know, what's the fraction of cell type number one times the methylation level in cell type number one plus the fraction of cell type number two plus methylation level in cell type number two, and so on. And some other noise, and we get all this information. That's, that's our data, okay? So this is the model that we have. Okay, so if you think about what most uh, methods do so far, which is in, in this, what, we call, what I called before the composition, they basically assume that this matrix here, the methylation level is, is constant. This kind of tensor here is constant. So we have, for all the individuals, we have the same methylation level for every uh, methylation site, okay? Which is obviously, um, not correct, right? And so the, the, the reason why you think that might be useful still is because the noise will come from, um, from, you know, from the side, from this side here. You're going to model the noise here. But that noise is not, it is not cell type specific. Uh, what we have is that we assume that this is variable in, in TCA, in tensor composition, in composition analysis. So, and then, you know, we have a bunch of methods of how to optimize this and some variants of what I just mentioned. There's, it gets more complicated, but this is kind of the basic idea. Uh, and, you know, when we run some power simulations, we get really uh, nice results. And, in fact, what we, one of the things that we show, and this is completely fresh, I guess Elio told me this just before the, co the talk, is that uh, when you look at the... Uh, let's say 500 samples, and you run our uh, analysis, this is going to be comparable to sorting the cells of 100 uh, individuals and run the analysis on those. Okay? So typically, you don't really have many, if you look at data sets, there is not so many. Sorting the cells, you, you have to guess which uh, sorted cells you're, you're working with. So you typically will go and we'll, uh, we'll have you know, five different cell types, you'll have to sort them. And then you have to run five times the methylation levels. This way, in this way, we just run a whole genome methylation on the on the bulk. And we ran some analysis on uh, a data set for rheumatoid arthritis. So this data set, we had uh, access to two types of data sets. One type was for specific cell types. Uh, this is CD4 uh, plus naive cells and memory cells. And what we what, but these are about 90 samples. Okay, 90 samples each. And so because there's not enough power, you don't really see anything here. So nothing passes the Bonferroni. Um, if you run our analysis on a data set which is larger, 
but it's public. That's the room that twice it's data set they showed you in the beginning. Then, uh, and you run CD4 plus specific analysis. So, uh, because you can choose which, which uh, analysis to, to run uh, in, in what I showed you before. Then we get five different uh, methylation sites that are associated. If you simply, instead of this, you took the Liu et al. data and you ran a simple analysis that adjusts for the cell counts, then you also get a bunch of those, but these ones are not replicated. So the, these five are replicated in, the, in what we have at the top. So then you can go back the, to the uh, specific cell type, the solar cell types, and now you're just checking five methylation sites, so you're not hurt by multiple hypotheses that much uh, when you try to replicate it, and we show that they're replicated. Uh, but when you go down to the, uh, to the one below, so this is basically just one, you know, just run regression and just hope that CD4 plus, uh, the methylation site is so different in, in CD4 plus that it's going to show in the whole, in the bulk sample. And it's sometimes true, and uh, Elio can help me here, but I think the two of them are uh, uh, overlap. The other ones don't, uh, they don't, uh, you know, you can't really replicate them in the CD plus uh, uh, data. Uh, so, so that basically, this is kind of like a, an example where we saw that it works well, and the reason why it's uh, still work in progress, we show in simulations that it all works well, but we're looking for more data sets to show more examples like this, basically. Okay, so I really talked about uh, refactor, which is the first method, and I kind of mentioned which, you know, the, the uh, sparse PCA method, which I think could potentially be more general than just applied, you know, application for, uh, the application for methylation. Uh, we applied it to methylation. By the way, we tried it. That's kind of a very natural question, but we tried it for expression data, for example, and it didn't work. It didn't perform worse than, uh, than let's say, PCA, uh, but it could be that it's just not sparse, so that the strongest signals are not sparse. We don't really know. Uh, and then, uh, base C is the method that I just mentioned in uh, briefly, so I'm not going to uh, discuss it. But uh, and then TCA is the the one that we did uh, in the end and that I mentioned in the end. And this, the the way I think about it is that if you wanted to do in silico cell sorting, in many cases in silico cell it, it, to do the cell sorting is not trivial. So for blood, it's it's not so difficult, but for other ones. Other tissues, it could be difficult. Uh, and so, if you wanted to do in silico cell sorting and then it was, uh, then that's, that's the way to go. Um, and so, yeah, so this is again, uh, there is a, except for the TCA that is not published yet, um, all the other things that I mentioned uh, appeared in these places. And uh, um, I guess the, most of the thanks should go to Elio, who's sitting over there. Can you raise your hand? Yeah, who did most of the work here. Uh, Regev uh, and Elio and Matan Gavish uh, worked together with me on the theoretical analysis. Uh, and, um, and thank you for listening, and let's go to the beach. So, Let's take one question and then go to the beach. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a great question. How do I choose T? Uh, so right, what we showed in our methylation paper is that at least in that data, it's not very sensitive. If you choose it 500 or 10,000, it's all going to be about the same results. If you go to 20, 30, 40, 50,000, results are slowly deteriorating. Uh, but it's a, kind of an open question. We have some ideas of how to do this, uh, but it's not, it doesn't seem to be like a very trivial question. It's kind of like the question. choose the dimension, which is also under some assumptions you can you can show something, but in practice it's pretty it's pretty tough to because you know the data doesn't behave exactly like the theory. Okay, so uh, let's stop here, and uh, I'm happy to talk more at the beach. <laughs>